Well, last time I was here, I actually did my talk in a Jedi robe. Um, but that was two years ago, so um, it's a different talk today. So I'm gonna just introduce myself, um, because if I do it, people say, oh, we want to, we didn't need that, and if I don't do it, people say, oh, so who are you? So uh, I'm Native Wired on Twitter. Be aware that if you follow me, uh, there'll be a lot of tweets. I am an agile coach. This is what we do. We run around and hug trees. Um, at least some people think so. Um, I must say I'm more on the human side of agile coaching. I used to think that all we needed was processes, and then I realized that it's mostly about values, and now I'm more like it's just about people. It's all about people. All that I do is about people. Um, I'm a professional speaker since I got paid once. Um, that makes me professional. Uh, I do all kinds of talks. I do a few agile talks, but most of my talks is actually in the area of stress and depression, for instance. Uh, it is about imposter syndrome. It's about having the courage to be who you are. Um, I even have workshops on courage as, as well. Um, I'm also a big hugger. I offer free hugs to people, even people I've never met. I'm so much of a hugger, I have it on my business card. But I'll never be professional, because a hug is something you share, not something you sell. Um, yeah, I should get a new picture for this since I started decorating the rest of my arm. Uh, I'm a big believer in being brave. I think that part of what we are missing a lot in our workplace, well, in our life, and part of why we have so many stress and depressions, is because we are not who we are. We keep spending time on being who we are not, because that's who we are supposed to. And this is to remind me every day to have the courage to be who I am, and not who everyone else wants me to be. And I'm also one of the people in inclusive collaboration. Uh, we are now up to seven conferences who have quiet rooms at their conferences. Um, but we also try to get other stuff in because we are so different and we need to have that space to be different. Not just to be nice, which is part of it, but because being different is very valuable. And yes, I am a unicorn. I am actually, I think, the only certified unicorn certifier in the world. Uh, and people think this is a little bit silly, but basically to me it's about, you know, we spend so much time in our workplace, and sometimes I meet people who just give it that little extra spark. And I started certifying people because we need that spark. If we just sit around all day and be serious, it's not going to help us. Uh, if we just sit around all day and have fun, it's not going to help us either. Like everything in life, it's a balance. So what I'm going to tell you today is some general ponderings about why we need to give people different tools. I'm going to tell you a story from a streaming company in Sweden uh, that I work for. Um, it might not be the tools that you expect, at least I hope not. I hope I'm going to challenge you a little bit and some kind of conclusion. So this one actually came out two days before I gave this talk the first time. It always shocks me how many leaders and managers think setting goals will somehow make them happen. Setting goals is the first step in a long, tough process of constant evaluation and readjustment. Saying we will improve X by 20% this year is not a magic spell. But somehow, this is how we act. We want to change, and ba -ba, the magic happens. More unicorns. This is how we act. We are asked to come into organizations and add our coaches. And ta-da, we're just going to make everything agile and happy and we're going to produce a lot and have really good story points uh, as measurements. But that's not how it works. The thing is that it takes a lot of time. We try, we have visions, we have plans. Sometimes we actually take the time to explain the why we want to achieve this. Sometimes we don't. We have trainings. We train people to do all kinds of things. So basically what we have is the mechanics. All that is in place in most of the companies I go to. And what do we get? We get an old horse. And we get really angry because it's not shiny and sparkly. The problem is, who do we actually work with? Most of the people I work with, including me, are tech people. Computer scientists, engineers, mathematicians, physicists, or just other kind of geeks. There's very few people I work with who are not nerds or geeks in some way. And what do we learn? We learn black and white. Does it compile? Will the test pass? Does it fulfill the requirements? That's all we learn. When we go to university, if we are lucky, we may need to learn how, we may learn how to present. When I was at university, I learned how to present a scientific article and how to write one. 
that's not very much about communication. It's very one-way communication, and basically it's about making it look really good so that you can get it into a magazine. Because if you work at the university, at least in Denmark, where we have new public management, you need to have a bunch of articles published every year, because otherwise you are not a good researcher. doesn't matter if anything in there is good. You just need to get a number produced. And that's kind of how we live our world. I think the new public management that we have done in the Nordic country is really horrible. We measure everything. Which means that sometimes we'll have people sitting there writing measurements down so that we can put in the measurements where they could be helping people. And this is in the whole public industry in Denmark. But what we really expect people to do besides all this, we expect people to collaborate. We expect people to work in teams. We expect people to communicate. And we're not talking about written communication. A lot of us will, might have learned this at some point. How do you write a good report? How do you do all these things? We actually expect people to talk to each other. We expect people to give or receive feedback, no matter which position you're in. A lot of people think of giving and receiving feedback, and this is something you do in your personal uh, review once a year. No, every time you have a pull request, every time you have a code review, every time you have somebody look at something you do, you are giving feedback or receiving feedback. And most people have no clue how, because nobody ever told us. If we're lucky, we pick something up as kids or in school and stuff like that. I'm lucky enough to come from a university where we actually work in teams. That helps a lot. But still, you don't learn anything. You just get thrown into a room and here, here, make a report. And then you figure it out. We don't learn about these things. We also talk a lot, at least I do, about generalizing specialists. I know some people will say, oh, in an agile team, everyone has to be able to do everything. I think that's a lot of crap. If you have a team where everyone can do everything, they're not very good at it. I don't want a team of people who are not very good at it. I want a team of people where everyone is really good at what they do. But they are also able to help in other areas when it's needed. If they are the second best one to do something, but they are the ones available, I want them to be able to do this, even if it takes three times as long. That's also something we don't learn. And moreover, in school, we get grades. That's how we learn. And we are so used to having to do something really well to do grades. We don't want to make mistakes. And actually, we do that all the time. Anyone who says they do not make a mistake, uh, I would uh, challenge you to remove the backspace on your computer. We make a lot of mistakes all the time, but we don't feel safe enough to do this. And the list goes on and on and on. And my experience is that when I go into companies, this is not something that's provided. We give them trainings in all kinds of computer languages, data science, whatever. We provide them with like, all kinds of tools that we need, whether it is a board or Jira or whatever, whether it's compiler tools, whatever we need. But all this soft stuff, you just do. Because, you know, it's all human, so we all know how to do it. But we don't. So this is from um, a friend of mine called, I think I should put his real name actually, Torbjörn. He says, maybe things become better if we accept them as they are, not as we want them to be. And then since Chris says I get better rating, I put in Grumpy Cat, because uh, you get better ratings when you put cat in your presentations. Um, this is really annoying. We have to accept things as they are, and then work from there. And I think that's one of the big mistakes we do in a lot of things we do. We talk about how do we want them to be. Ta-da, now you are a team. Work together, collaborate, produce stuff. Gel. Okay, gel. That's what we do. And that's not how it works. And it's not like this is new. I only found one source on this. Uh, there's multiple out there, but uh, my Cohen uses the ADAPT model. Um, we need to give people the ability to do things. First, you need to be aware that you need to do something. Then you need to want to do it. But that's not enough. It doesn't help that you really want to be able to give and receive feedback, that you want to do good code reviews if you don't know how. And we need to provide that. So this leads me to my story, because one of the things we realized during the last nine months is that storytelling is a big part of this. So I'm gonna tell you a story about me working in a Swedish company who streams music and went on the stock exchange. Uh, so most of you probably know who it is. We work with tribes and squads and everything. They have autonomy. The problem is that because they are so popular, 
The way they do autonomy is mostly do whatever. Autonomy is not do whatever. Look it up in the dictionary. Autonomy means do whatever within a certain frame. But somehow this got lost. Nobody sets the frame. And I think this is one of the problems I see in Agile as well. You have teams, oh, they need to be autonomous. But what if they want to do something, but I can't do anything as a manager because they're autonomous. No, as a manager, as a leader, it's your job to set the frames. Because otherwise, we are not going to go in that direction. If you want your organization to do Scrum, say, we are going to do Scrum. If you say, I don't care what you use as long as you learn something from it, say that. But make it explicit. And that's one of the problems is that if people are not used to this, and if people don't like, and another thing we don't like, conflict. Ooh, that's really scary. Saying to someone, you can't do this because it's not what I expect of you. That's really scary, and it becomes scary in an agile organization because we want to have that low power hierarchy that Chris was talking about. And that then makes us, oh, should we then all be friends? That's not how it works. As a leader, it's good to be friends. It's good to be able to take that cup of coffee but if you are a leader, you need to set that direction. You need to set those boundaries. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And the other part is autonomy is not all we need. If we look at Daniel Pink, um, he has this, there's actually a really good uh, video. Oh, by the way, I better say that before I forget it. At the end of the slides, which will be online, there are a lot of links to all the things I'm talking about. There's also my information. Uh, feel free to come up to me here, but also uh, you can contact me anytime. Daniel Pink has this uh, book, and for the rest of us who are really good at buying books and not reading them, there's also a really short um, animated um, movie about this. We need autonomy, but we also need mastery and purpose to be motivated. Which means that if we don't have that vision, if we don't have the why, we're not going to be motivated. And if we don't have the mastery, we're also not going to be motivated. And mastery is the same like the other things. It doesn't happen on its own. Just because you sit and code for 10 years doesn't mean you're a good coder. You could have 10, time, 10 times one year experience. Or you could have 10 years experience. No matter what you do, if you just keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're actually not experienced. So the way we did this was that um, this is the leadership team of where I work. Um, normally, you will have a product lead, a tech lead, and a design lead. We don't have design leads because we don't have any GUI. So the way it works is that you have two leads. And what they have decided to do is saying, okay, we focus on the tech and the product. So we would like to include the agile coaches in the leadership team. Because you are really good at organizations and you're really good at people. So we sat down and we created a vision as the first thing. And then we took this vision on an off-site. We went away for three days with the whole tribe, which is like 50 people. What we wanted to do was set clear expectations. We wanted to set a direction. This is where we want to be in a year. And we wanted people to be involved, because if they are not involved, they're not having, they don't have a buy-in. They don't find us interested if we don't involve them. And we wanted them to discuss these things as well. So we decided to make an agenda about expectation management, about vision and about aspirations for our tribe. So for expectation management, the first thing that we did was in the presentation, our tribe lead stood up and said, this is what I expect of you. Clear, and he said this explicitly, this is what I expect of you. It took like, I don't know, a month of coaching for him to say that out loud. Because you are not supposed to expect something of people who are autonomous. But once we kind of got this, people actually like it. People like that they know what is expected of them. You can always challenge it, but if you don't know what's expected of you, where are you going to go? And then we made this exercise where each group of people, so we had engineers, we had agile coaches, chapter leads, product owners, and tribe leads. They would say, what do I expect of the other one? We did it as an agile coach. I expect the tribe leads to set a direction so that people know where to go. And then the other party could then accept or reject the expectation, or they could say, I, expect, I will accept this with comments. Because often we don't have these discussions. And like we, had, we tried out something called technical owners, so you'll kind of be the guardian of, of the technology, just as a product owner is the guardian of, of having a good product. We want someone who makes sure we actually get rid of some tech death uh, bit by bit. 
that we take care of these things. And it was a big surprise to one of them that he was supposed to be a tech role model because we never talked about this. So having these talks about expectation was a really big thing. And then we kind of used this image of building a house where we have, let me see if my pointer works, maybe not. We have our vision and mission, like where do we want to go, how do we contribute to this? And then what we decided to do was to put up pillars and say, we have these different elements that are important to us. And within each, we have five aspirations. This is where we aspire to be. And the point of that was, if we have these discussions where we have the whole tribe present, we get everyone's opinions. As a leadership team, we make the decisions, but we want to hear what people think. And then we can start working on strategies, making roadmaps, and doing all the things that we do in our daily lives. So we created an open space. I don't know if you are familiar with open space, but basically we had four sessions. In the first one, we talked about people. And we had five stations, one for each aspirations, and people could walk around and discuss the ones that they wanted to. They could move around if they wanted to, or they could stay in one place. Then we did the same for technology, delivery, and product. These are the four pillars we chose to focus on in our tribe. So if we look at the people pillar, our aspirations is, we have a, I'm going to read them because I can't remember them by heart. We have a psychologically safe environment that enables trust and an open collaborative culture. We set an example for how to embrace diversity and inclusion at Spotify. We work in small squads with clear, inspiring missions. Squads are trusted and expected to own and solve problems. This was actually one that people were struggling a bit with because all of a sudden they were not only um, you know, expected to do stuff, they were actually expected to own their own problems. It doesn't mean that they need to solve all their problems, but it means that they own them. It is their problems. They can come to us all they want, we will help them all we can. But we're not going to solve it for them. They're not babies. Um, we cultivate a growth mindset and always strive to improve. We are generous in giving and receiving feedback to support each other in this. So often we have a fixed mindset. I find that really intelligent people have a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is where you think there's a boundary to anything you can learn. And often intelligent people will have that because we look at the IQ scale, we kind of, that's kind of, you know, we can go and we can measure that, we can measure all our skills. And the thing is, if you believe in a fixed mindset, you also believe there's a boundary. So it's actually a kind of a um, way of looking at it as scarcity. There's a scarcity of whatever skills we can have. Our brain is only so big, we can only learn so many things. Whereas a growth mindset is something where we say we can always grow, we can always learn, we can always expand. And that is a mindset of abundance. When the second Chris talked about how do you measure if things are good in your company, we often talk about money. To me, this is a scarcity mindset because often what you do with a business case is you say, I need to make money on that business case and that business case and that business case and that business case because otherwise we might run out of money. To me, this is scarcity. If you say, okay, what happens if we lose money on this one, but we can do some cool stuff and then we make money on these three ones? Instead of just having this business case that we need to make money on everything. I used to work in IBM and everyone would try to get on trainings in January because otherwise there might not be a training budget. Because when you get to the end of the year or the end of the quarter, you have to get good numbers. So you want to lower the cost, so you stop all trainings. So that's why people from IBM go on trainings in January or at the beginning of every quarter. Because that's the only time you are sure you can be allowed. Sometimes they will even cancel a training that you paid for and paid trip for um, without getting the money back. Because they think about one quarter. And what we want people to think about is, is like think bigger. Yes, we want people to focus on what you want to do right now, but we also want people to grow not only as people, but also in the stuff that they do. If we just keep doing the same things, Spotify's, uh, this is my own opinion, I'm not employed at Spotify, I just worked as a consultant. Um, um, if you just keep doing that, nobody's gonna want Spotify in 10 years, because it's just, yeah, I've been there, done that. 
They were like the first streamers, but yeah, if they don't change, nobody's going to want it. So we also want people to think out of the box. And the last one was everyone gives and feels the respect they deserve as a valued team member, tribe member. So what we did with this was we sent people out, we had them discuss these things, and it was really, really interesting, um, the discussions that came up. And most people had never, ever discussed these things before. They had talked about, you know, which programming languages do we use? Which kind of environment do we build up? Uh, do we want a physical board, or do we want a Jira board, or do we want LeanKit, or do we want blah, blah, blah? They had all these discussions, but very few of them actually talked about these people things. And what we also did is we, we asked them to vote. So everyone was given four mandatory green votes. You had to vote for one on each pillar. And one read, I really, really don't agree on this. Um, for the people one, we had 40 vo 41 votes out of 50 people. So 41 people said psychological safety is the single most important thing we want to look at. Uh, we did not see this coming. We thought that it would kind of be spread out. Um, the only two red ones we got, one was about we want people to do tests first, which a lot of developers apparently don't agree on, because why would I need to write a test before I write my code? I can tell you why, because I did it. You write a test, and you run it, and it turns green, and you go, fuck, I don't have any code. And then you realize that your test is wrong. So you have to write your test, make it red, and then you write the code so it turns green. That's why you do test first. But a lot of developers do not believe in this. So what we did was we said, OK, we'll change it to you have to have well-tested code. Um, and then we hope to sneak it in later. Um, and the other part was actually about working in squads, because we had one person who thinks that we should not just work together in squads. We should strive to work together as a tribe uh, and have everyone be accountable for the work of the tribe. And then the hard part came. We had to do this bit by bit by bit. And that's the really annoying part about this. It takes so long to get these things to happen. Um, we started out with psychological safety, since this was the most important thing. Um, so in Q4, what we did, started out with, was doing a survey. We took the survey from Google. So Google did this big experiment about what makes teams work, what makes high-performing teams. And the one thing that really separates the whole thing is psychological safety. And they also have a test you can run. We decided to change this test a little bit so that we not only said, like, um, um, so one of the questions would be like, I, there's someone in my team who undermines me uh, deliberately. And what we did was we divided everything up in two. So one would be about um, the person I feel most comfortable with and the person I feel least comfortable with. To figure out if it was a general problem in the squad or if it was a problem with one person. So we did this, we ran the survey. And then we did an awareness workshop for everyone in the tribe. Actually, we did a lot of awareness workshops because we would only bring in eight people maximum. We spread them out across the squads so that they would be together with people they didn't know very well. Because sometimes when you talk about stuff that is really personal or about making mistakes, it's more comfortable to speak to someone you don't know really well. Uh, I do the same things when I work on my courage workshops. I try to pair people up and then have them talk, just the two of them. Because if, you wanna, if I asked all of you now to go into a debate about psychological safety, most of you will feel really uncomfortable because there's too many people in the room. If I asked you to discuss it two and two, it would feel much safer because it's just one person. You might never see this person again. Um, so we can talk about small things. So we did this awareness workshop, and most people didn't really know what it means. A lot of people think that psychological safety means being comfortable. It doesn't. It's really nice to be comfortable, we want that a lot of the time. But psychological safety is also about being uncomfortable, but feeling safe enough to be uncomfortable. Because if you do something, if like let's say you make a big mistake. Takes the, like we had one guy who a few years ago took half a Spotify down. So basically he submitted this code that was not supposed to go into production, but it did, then he went for lunch. And he was like, oh yeah, my phone is beeping a lot, but hey, I'll look at it when I get back. Then when he came back, they had fixed the problem. So we call this the burger incident. But basically, he took half of Spotify down. Um, and what he said was, no one ever blamed me. 
not a single person blamed me for doing this. We still joke about it, we still say, oh, uh, we joke about it, the code that he submits, but in a kind way. No one never went to him like this. And that is not comfortable. If you take down half of whatever your company does, that's not comfortable. Even if you make a small mistake doing pair programming, it's not like, woohoo, I made a mistake and the guy next to me can see it. Uh, every time we make mistakes, you are uncomfortable. But psychological safety is about being comfortable in these situations, also in these situations. Um, and a lot of people are not aware of this. Um, then what we did in Q1 was we went into each squad and asked them to create concrete actions. Because one thing is talking about this. That's really nice. Um, we often have the same problems in retrospectives. We have really nice retrospectives. We go like, blah, 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 this is a problem, and we should do this. And then nothing happens. And we go the next week, blah, 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 this is a problem. What's missing here? The actions. If we don't have the action, nothing is going to happen. Um, so we created an action workshop. Oh, now you're bored. See you. Um, we created an action workshop for each of the squads where we wanted them to figure out what is the most important thing for you. A lot of people actually found that the pull request, the code reviews, was the hardest thing. And the interesting part was it was usually not receiving it, it was giving it. How do I tell someone that this code is really wrong without making him feel uncomfortable? So we did a lot of different things. Some people do the fuck up of the week. So on Fridays they will start with 10 minutes. This is my biggest fuck up of the week. Because we have a lot of these, oh, we should celebrate failure. And then people go like, look at post-its. They made really bad glue, and now we have post-its. That's not really failure. Well, it started out as a failure, but now it's a big success. What about all the things that never amounted to something? Where you took something down, or where you tried to code something, and it found out it actually had the opposite result of what you expected. So what they do now, every Friday, is they start up with 10 minutes of, this was my biggest fuck up this week. Um, and for each one of them, they did different things. One of them, one of our squads, have two people who are extroverts, and the rest are introverts. And guess who speaks in the meetings? The extroverts. And it's not because they don't value the input from the introverts, but they just forget. That's the problem. I'm also an extrovert. I sometimes forget. I talk and I talk and I talk, and I'm like, whew, wait, I have to take the step back. That's also, by the way, the hardest part about being an agile coach is to take a step back and let people fail on their own when you know you can help them and speak up. But what they decided to do was every time we have something really important like architecture questions or something like that, we are going to take a round. We are first going to take two minutes for people to think inside their head, which is also good for extrovert people to get a little bit of quiet. And then we take a round and we ask everyone for their opinion. Because my experience with a lot of introvert people is they will feel like they don't have an opinion on this. And then they leave the meeting and then they go like, oh, wait. We can see, I can see this when I have a workshop. If I ask people to come with inputs, some people will come with really poor inputs. If I ask the same guy in a workshop, take five minutes and write stuff down on a post-it. The inputs are very, very different. Most people who are introverts think inside their head. They kind of need to turn things around a few times. I, I think on my feet. And that's actually part of why I'm a member of this inclusive collaboration is because I see this all the time. I see people not being able to collaborate because we cater for those who speak up. And that's what we learn. That's what we learn in school. You get promoted. Who, hey, who puts up their hand first? Oh, you're a good girl. You're a good boy. You get promoted. You get good grades. That's what we learn. And a lot of introverts will then have to use extrovert behavior to even be heard for anything. Which you can do to some extent, but it can also hurt you really badly. Uh, you can look into some of Brian Little's works for that as well. Um, so that's what we did. We went in, we talked with everyone, and again, we did the same thing. We kind of said, okay, think about it. Then we have people work two and two, and then we had them collaborate. And then we also created a feedback workshop, because that was actually a big surprise to me that people did not know how to give and receive feedback. All the managers that we have have been to some kind of feedback training. And all of the feedback has been about how do you give feedback to your employees. 
nobody of the well, that's not true. A few of the people in the squads had voluntarily taken a feedback training, but that was it. And none of them had learned about receiving feedback. How do you act when you receive feedback? So we decided to work on these things for the first two quarters. Um, and it made a really, really big difference. So if you look at psychological safety, it is about Believing that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, and mistakes. So Amy Ed Edmondson has a TED talk on this, where she talks about going into hospitals, looking at medication errors. So she looked into this hospital, and what she found was surprising that in the departments that looked like the, most, the best departments, they had the most medication mistakes. And she was like, this is really weird. There's something going on. These look like... They work well together, they do things right, and they have the most mistakes. There's something going on. And she started looking into it. It turns out that if you feel safe, you admit your mistakes. So because these departments were working really well and people felt safe, they actually reported all the medication mistakes. And that's when she started looking more into psychological safety. We actually used Josh Yar, I am not sure how to pronounce his name, uh, about what are you not afraid to be. And it's about, I am not afraid to be myself. Very important. Especially because we have now 19 nationalities out of 46 people. And we cover five continents. We have a lot of different cultures. We're still not Australia, by the way, if you want to come work for us. Um, it's about not being afraid to raise problems if there is one not being afraid to take risks, not being afraid to disagree, is even if there's someone more senior than you, whatever that means. Not be afraid to ask questions. And what we saw was that people who just started asked a lot of questions. But then when you've been there a while, you kind of go like, oh, I've been here for two years, I should actually know that. I'm a senior coder, I'm a blah blah, I should know that. No, you don't have to. And the one that we focused on the most, because that's what people feel like, to not be afraid to make mistakes. So the result is, we now have people speaking up. <coughs> we actually have people coming up to our tribe leads with their problems. It took more than eight months of our tribe leads over and over and over again saying, please come to us if you have any problems or any good ideas, before they started doing this. Even in Spotify, where the hierarchy is really, really low, it took eight months for people to speak up. We now see people seeking help, also outside their squads. Before, they would seek help in their network. So they would go outside squad, but it would be, yeah, I know this guy that I worked with a year ago in this other company, and uh, I will go ask him for help. Now, they actually seek help outside the squads. We even had people who come into the quarterly planning and go like, we have too much this quarter, is there any other squad who can help us? Otherwise we have to say no to our stakeholders. Oh, that's another thing, they started saying no. Before, the, the feeling they had was, we get a goal, so this is what we do the next quarter. Now what they do is, we get a goal, we look at how much capacity we have, can we do it? We say yes. If we don't feel comfortable, we say, Sorry, we cannot commit to that. We'll do our best, but we can't commit to it. They never thought this was an option before. And I think a lot of people have this, that if somebody asks you for a deadline or asks you for a commitment, a lot of people forget you have the option to say no. But we feel like we should do this. We are nice people. Um, we did this really fun exercise, what's not to like about this code. Uh, you can find it online as well, the description. Of it. So basically, the whole squad sits in front of a big screen and look at code. And go, what's not to like about this code? Oh, well, and it can be anything from indentions to, you know, the way you use variables to, oh, that is just really crappy code and why do we have so many lines to whatever. Um, and by having this and having facilitating it this, people now, first of all, get better code but they feel more comfortable uh, looking at code and making feedback. And they learn from each other, which is a side effect. 
And what we also found was we made a poster called What's Psychological Safety to Us? So with all these things, we did exactly the same with the leadership team. So everyone who's considered some sort of leader in our tribe had to go through the same things together because not only are they part of a squad, they are also part of a leadership and leadership needs to lead. And the way you lead is by example. It's like when you have kids. You can tell your kids whatever you want. But if they see you doing something else, like tell your kids they can't curse. And they learn so many words from you. I don't know if you ever tried that. I don't have kids. I have a lot of nephews and nieces. And you stand with them and they, they make this remark and you kind of go, fuck, that's mine. <laughs> yeah, so you can tell them as many times as you want. You can't do that. But if they see you doing that, they're going to do that. And it's actually the same with whatever we do. I believe in leadership in all. No matter what we do, we lead by example. It can be good examples or it can be bad examples. So they also had to go through everything of this. They had to go all through this. And some of the people were like, why do we need this? We are safe. Um, and realizing that maybe we're not. Even in a place where, we, where you feel safe, somebody else might not be. One question that we asked people that people found very uncomfortable was, what do you do to make other people feel unsafe? We often don't think about that. We think about what do other people do to us? But what do you do? Like one thing I do that made people feel unsafe until they know me is I ask for deadlines. So if somebody has an action, I say, so well, will you have this done by? And what people hear is, I want you to do this as fast as possible and give me a date now. When really what I'm saying is, I would like a realistic deadline where you take into account all the other stuff that you have to do. And if you don't have time to do it, I would like to hear that. But they hear the other part until they know that actually I'm asking for their input and not just to give them a, me a date that's as fast as possible. So I know this is one of the things that I do that make people feel unsafe. Uh, in the leadership team that I showed you before, the four of us have a um, interesting tone sometimes with each other. Um, as you will see with Catherine and I, we're actually not really good role models. Um, so we will sometimes tease each other because she prefers Star Trek and I prefer Star Wars and we have other interesting opinions. Um, and sometimes we're not good role models because we will nag on each other every time we see each other. And people see this. So that's also something we had to work on because our tone was really fun. But we're also very aware it's fun when we are in a room. It's not fun when one of the leaders says, says something really important and I make fun of him on stage. Because all of a sudden, I make fun of one of their leaders trying to give them direction. So that's also something we were very aware of. What we then tried to do was to create rules for this. You know, I love that. I love rules. And I love spreadsheets. And I like state transition machines because they are nice. And then we started, yeah, you can always ask questions. Also, if you're not new, also if you are feel like you're supposed to know this, even if you're the senior blah, blah. We ended up having all this and kind of go like, Okay, no, nobody's ever going to read this. And we want it to be something that speaks to people. So we ended up with this. I understand that people are different. And I encourage everyone to be themselves. We started out with, I can be myself. But that's only taking care of you. And what we want is people who take care of each other. I am curious and open to others' opinions without judging. That's really hard. When people say something that's very much against what you do, it can be really hard not to judge. But we are so different. And there are so many things that are different. Um, there's a Chris Matt show, two examples of uh, Spider-Man Spider magazine. One is worth like $1 and one is worth $4,000, I think, because one is used. And the other one is nice and pretty. And even that, that almost looks the same. And that's just a, a comic book. I once had a guy who brought me flowers at work, and I'm like, okay, this is interesting, what do I do now? And like, why is he hitting on me? It turns out, in Ukraine, to show respect for your female colleagues, you bring them flowers on International Women's Day. <laughs> um, and I was luckily brave enough to go and I, um, okay, why are you giving me flowers? And he told me this. I mean, Ukraine is not that far from Denmark. And still, this little flower almost created a conflict. Because what do I do? Uh, do I pull away from him to not lead him on? What do I do? And basically, he was just showing me respect. 
And when we live in a country or in a, in a society with so many cultures, we need to think about these things. I encourage others to ask questions. That's what we brought it down to because it ended up being too many ifs and whats and also and... I am mindful that my words and actions affect others, so I adjust my behavior. This is something that is interesting because first time I did this talk, people came up to me and said, does that mean we all need to be perfect? And that we cannot make mistakes? And we all need to be pretty unicorns? And be happy all the time? No. But it does mean that if you say something that hurts somebody else, I expect you to think about this and possibly change your behavior. Um, but it also means that if somebody says something to, to you that um, you feel offen you feel is offensive, go talk to them because they probably don't know. And there's stuff like uh, what I often hear, like if people make an offensive joke and they go, but it's just a joke. Yeah. Like one of the things that really ticks me off and I, might, I feel like punching people in the face, though I have not yet, is indicating that I am not a woman because I studied computer science. And usually what happens here is all the women in the room go like, mm -hmm, and all the guys like go like, what? People say that to you? Yes, they do. They say that to you. You are not a proper woman because you are in IT. And even if that's a joke, that is not funny. And I expect people to stop making those jokes. That's what it means. But it also means we don't want to be tiptoeing around and being afraid to make jokes and make mistakes. Because if we are not human, what is the point? Then we'll just be coding monkeys or robots. That's not what we want. We want people to be human. But be mindful. There's a situation where you can have stupid jokes and there's a, uh, a situation where you cannot. Like, I just called Chris out for leaving. I would not call anyone else out. Chris is the only person who makes indecent noises when he hugs me and who does not get told off for it. Um, people around me go like, oh, okay, that's really creepy. But we know each other really well and that's fun. Uh, but if I was in a situation where I had a psychological safe workshop, I would not accept that. So that's what it's about. There are situations where things are okay and if you hurt someone, talk about it and then adjust your behavior. We all make mistakes. And I provide a context where others feel safe admitting theirs. So no making fun of that. It is just this. Oh, everyone knows that. Um, so it's so easy for us to do this. Like, it, well, you don't know that? Everyone knows that. Like the first time I found a really, really big um, memory leak, I was told, you know what? Everyone knows that there are no memory leaks in Java. Because I was a tester. Turns out there is. Um, but that made me feel so small that I was afraid to bring up the next thing I found. And emotions do belong at work. This is also something people find a little bit um, unconventional. A lot of people are taught we should be professionals, come to work. Being professional and human is mutually exclusive. No, it's not. We are humans. If we decide to take all emotions and pack them outside, we're going to spend so much energy trying to be unemotional. Energy that we could use on communicating with people, talking to people, producing really good code. Emotions do belong at work. And if you don't care about what you do, why don't you have another job? I mean, I get really passionate about my job because I care. I love every time I see a person grow. Like one of the things I do is I coach people to speak, um, a lot of young women because they're afraid to be in public. Not only young women, I, but mostly of them come to me because they see like, oh, there's a woman speaking, maybe I can ask her for help. Every single time I see one of my protégés on stage, my heart just bursts with pride because that's why I do it. Um, and those emotions do belong at work, otherwise you're working on something wrong. If you don't care about anything you do, you're doing something wrong. And then we put up these five, show respect, Assume good intent. No matter what people say, assume good intent. Listen without judgment, <coughs> be kind, and care for each other. And then we have a longer document that says, this is continuous work. This is something we need to do over and over and over and over and over again. We need to continue doing this thing all the time. It's a bit like having a car. You need to actually put new oil on your car, otherwise it's not gonna run. All these things, we need to do that with all the human things that we have as well. 
Some other examples of what we did was, um, yeah, this. Um, I can't find a tweet where I read it the first time. Um, once you've told people about your mission or vision so many times, you feel like you're going to puke the next time, that's when they start listening. Because you have worked with your vision for so long, you cared about it, you, you, know, you, you took care of it, this is your little baby, and then you present it. And people are like, okay, this is interesting, and then two minutes later they forgot about it. And then you have to tell them again. But you have been working with this for a month. So we need to tell them over and over again. And again, the please come to us, please come to us, please come to us. Another thing we did was to celebrate nationalities. We realized that when we talk about diversity, it's so easy to look at gender. Most of the time, we can guess the gender of people, which means we can look at, okay, um, male, female, non-binary. Some countries, they allow you to actually register this as well. But what about all the other things? What about age? What about nationalities? So that's something we did, is we have been practicing saying good morning in all languages. Um, I can still not do it in more than six, I think. Um, but we kind of want to say, you know what, we are grateful for having all these nationalities because that is so interesting. That's what makes our work interesting. Um, and then, of course, we also did some tech stuff, some product, and some delivery stuff. Like, we brought um, James, um, JB Weinsberger in and Kevin Henney uh, in two different quarters to go do some pair programming with people because they are these old rats and they know really good stuff. So if they pair program with people, they see how it's done. We created roadmaps for tech and for product and we aligned them, which is also interesting. So every quarter we try working on this and we pick a new thing every single quarter. Our next quarter is gonna be summer vacation because in Sweden everyone takes five weeks of vacation in a row. So most people are gone. So we're actually gonna look at how are we doing on our aspirations? Which one do we need to look at next? So this is kind of a break uh, in this quarter. So the stuff that we learned was the tools that were the most important, repetition. It is so important to repeat things over and over again. Enabling people, giving them the tools to do all these things is really, really necessary. Repetition. Communication is essential and we suck at it. Even people who've been in industry for a long time suck at it. Involving people, because if it's not their own, they're not going to care. Then there's just going to be this manager standing there going, blah, 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 this is important for you. You need to involve people. Repetition. Safety. Providing that safe environment where people actually feel comfortable enough to admit mistakes. To say, you know what, we don't have anything to show at show and tell this time because we just broke everything down. And not being afraid to do so. Storytelling is important because people don't remember fancy slides or whatever, they remember stories. We have been telling stories since before we could write. If you look at some of the paintings, some of them might, that we have on walls in France, some of them might be before we could even speak. We tell stories, that's how we learn. And repetition. And it takes a lot of time and investment, but it is worth it because if you have safe teams, you have people who are motivated, they will start performing. It's not the other way around. Once they perform, then you can make them safe. Making them safe makes them perform. If they're not safe, they're not gonna take risks. They're gonna do all this, the safe stuff, which means coding things that, you know, you, I know this is gonna be a success. They're not gonna try out crazy stuff. Like wearables for cats is one of the ideas that came up. Because there's so many cats, why shouldn't they have their own Spotify? Um, I'm not sure if that will ever be something, but you never know how people treat their pets nowadays. So basically, it takes a lot of time, and it helps. It is totally worth it. We see now, we are actually delivering what we promise. Not always, and not everything, but we are starting to deliver what we promise. People feel safe. People feel better in our tribe than they do in general by being Spotify. So, cat picture. Please remember to rate the session. Uh, and like I said, I have all my information in the slides as well, and a lot of links you can look at. So, thank you very much. Thank you.